If I wasn't undergoing near-death experiences in the gang area, then I was clashing with other maniacal foes, the hood cops, who could now identify me on sight. Like other blacks from my neighborhood, it was instinctive for me to run from the cops to avoid harassment, getting set up, brutalized, or killed. I knew that cops had carte blanche to violate my rights or blow me away, which made me nervous. Black people have known for many, many years that some white cops are racist, despite society's bland denials. One evening, while exiting a liquor store on Century and Budlong with Buddha, Herc, Monk, and Blackie, a lone cop car cruised by then made a U-turn after catching sight of us walking while you formed black, a serious offense, then enter the present moment. Two cops jumped out of the car and one of them hollered out, Halt, Tookie, Halt. I darted away crossing the street under the cover of darkness and heard a volley of shots. Time slowed. I felt as if I was running in place on a treadmill. Bullets whistled by me as I ran through a vacant lot and cut into an alley. I stepped into a hole and flew out into the air, landed on my stomach, jumped up, and continued to run. Soon the entire area was alive with Lennox patrol cars and a helicopter. I was cornered in the backyard. The cops were doing door-to-door -door searches for a man who allegedly shot at a policeman. It was only a matter of time before I'd be discovered hiding in an old shed. I didn't expect to make it out alive. I heard the cops enter the backyard. I could see their flashlights shining through the tiny cracks in the shed. Seconds later, the door swung open, revealing shotguns pointing inside. Voices ordering me not to move. It was chaos. Some cops were telling me to lie down, stay still, while others hollered. I should walk toward them with my hands in the air. Each command was punctuated with, or I'll blow your black ass head off. An elderly black woman peeped her head through the screen door and turned on the light. I could hear her shaky voice asking, is that the dangerous killer officers? One cop spat up. Yes, that's him, madam, and he's going to jail. She gasped, oh my lord, thank you, officers. After being handcuffed, I was dragged through a gauntlet of flashlights, batons, fists, and kicks to the body. By the time I reached the Lennox police station, I was hardly able to walk. They dragged me along and threw me in a cell. Buddha had contacted my mother. She and Fred drove around, hoping to find me before the cops did. When they showed up at the station, the desk officer said the charge was an assault with a deadly weapon on a peace officer. The cop spread the canard that I had shot several times at a cop. My mother was frantic. The following day, the cops stood outside the cell door threatening to pay me back for shooting at their partner. Since I wasn't handcuffed or incapacitated, their threats meant nothing to me. Later on, I was told there were investigators in the field looking for the gun they thought I had used to shoot at an officer. I knew, I knew in order for them to avoid a lawsuit and to justify the shooting, they had to play the charade to the end. Since the mysterious weapon was never found, I was released after 72 hours. On my way out, the sneering desk cop said, you are one lucky ninja because my partner is an expert marksman. Before I exited out of my mother's earshot, I told the cop, well, that devil buddy of yours couldn't be too much of an expert. The cracker missed. I had become the cop's prime target. It was a perilous badge of distinction. My mother, aware of the cop's dangerous potential, feared that one day she'd receive a call that cops had murdered me. In South Central, it was common for mothers to not only worry about street elements devouring their son, but also to worry about death by cop. Next thing I knew, my mother and I were on a Greyhound bus bound for Oakland, California, where my biological father was living with a new wife, son, and daughter. The plan was for me to live with them. They hoped this would change my life. I recall sitting in the back of my father's 1971 Eldorado Cadillac in the parking lot of some park. I sat there making noises, sucking my teeth, disinterested in hearing anything he had to say. He blabbered about how I looked crazy wearing a wide brim hat and a long cross earring. And then laughingly said, hell, only the girls wear earrings. I had to press my hands together so as to not sucker punch him upside the back of his head. I didn't know this man, nor did I care to, and there was absolutely nothing he could tell me. When he decreed that I was going to school every day, whether I liked it or not, I asked, are you man enough to make me? My mother intervened with, shut up boy and listen, that's the problem with you. After this one-sided conversation, we headed back to the motel where my mother and I spent the night before. Meeting my father was a moment of disconnection. His face was blurred. 
His spoken words were academic and his eye contact was non-existent. His strategy to use the hardcore approach to reach me was impractical or was as impractical as a cop's attempt to terrorize me into social reform. It was a weird father and son encounter, total absence of recognition and a reception cold as ice. My father didn't return so that afternoon I left the motel, returned to Los Angeles and stayed with my homeboy AC and his mother near 112th and Budlong. Living at AC's mother's house suited me just fine. It was the main crib hangout for ditching school, getting high, and sexual pleasures. When AC's mother was at work, the house was resolving. When AC's mother was at work, the house was a revolving door for women. It was there I met Joanne, who came by looking for her 17-year-old daughter. We struck up conversation and were soon in her Lincoln Continental headed for her home in Gardena, Vermont. Though Joanne was 36 years old and married with five children my age and older, she could have easily passed for 21. She was attractive and voluptuous. After the first time having sex with her, Joanne tripped me out when she led me into another room that was red padded and had three tables with two blender machines and a huge wooden bowl filled with fresh fruit. Standing in a corner in her panties and bra, trying to look defenseless, she asked me to throw some grapes, cherries, and apricots at her. She told me not to use the larger fruits because they were for someone else who liked to get hit with them. I thought probably her husband. I obliged her, though I was edgy about Joanne's fetish. I couldn't fathom the connection between sex and being pelted with fruit, but I wasn't the weirdo. Plus, the sex was excellent. On the 8th or ninth occasion, Joanne picked me up right after I had gotten loaded, sniffing glue and smoking weed. After sex, we headed to Joanne's padded fruit room. She stood in the corner and while I was throwing grapes, Joanne cried, No, stop. Don't do that. When I stopped, she said, No matter what I say or do, don't stop. As I continued to throw the grapes, Joanne said, Throw them a little harder, which I did. But when she screamed out, Harder, harder. I started firing those grapes and cherries with the velocity of a major league pitcher. When the bowls of grapes and cherries were empty, I pitched plums, oranges, apples, and cantaloupes. Being loaded, I seemed to be throwing the fruit in slow motion, but was actually moving at the speed of an animated cartoon character. When I ran out of fruit, I even threw the wooden fruit bowls and the blenders. After regaining my composure, I saw that Joanne was crouched in the corner, cowering and crying. We rolled back in silence to AC's place. I realized our sexual trist was over. When I wasn't kicking it at AC's house, there were other activities to keep me busy. Once a mob of Crips from the west and east sides caught a bus downtown. After mobbing a couple of clothing stores, I spotted a leather coat shop near a corner down the street from the Greyhound bus station. I knew exactly how to seize the moment and elevate my reputation. There were no less than 25 of us prepared to try to brand down these there were no less than 25 of us prepared to try on brand new leather coats i told everyone to find themselves a coat of choice and then said let's go when the salesman asked sir how do you intend to pay for all this i told her put it on the crib bill i kicked open the little wooden swing gate and we all walked out while we were at a hamburger stand eddie archie and I took off ahead of everybody to get the first crack at the merchandise. At the front door of May's company, several patrol cars pulled up. The cops jumped out with guns and ordered us to raise our hands. We were handcuffed, put in the back seat of a car, and driven down the street to be identified for a robbery. As the car pulled up, six youths standing outside of Clifton's restaurant on Broadway mistakenly identified us. Apparently, there were other crips around because we got busted for something we didn't do at Clifton's. The three of us were taken to the police station and placed in separate cells. Tookie Law was firmly in place.